So thank you all for being here. I hear that the next group's got a cheering section out here in the crowd, so hopefully they, you guys pump them up. There we go. There we go. All right. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. You're small but mighty here on the main stage. Um, so next up, we have a really interesting panel. Um, they're going to be talking. We got some folks from across the pond, uh, the other pond, the Atlantic pond. So far, they can, they've traveled a long way to be here with you guys and talk to you about how XR uh, is being used in healthcare over uh, in the UK. So we're going to have uh, two moderators for, for this panel. The first is uh, Ross O'Brien. He is the Director of Innovation and Technology at the National Health Service. And we also have Sarah Tico who is the founder of uh, Hatsumi. So please welcome Ross and Sarah up to the main stage. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, uh, my name is Ross O'Brien, and this is... Sarah TK. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to talk to you today about the work we've done in XR Healthcare in the UK. Um, if I can uh, uh, give you a quick intro to the reason why we're interested in doing this work um, uh, in terms of healthcare and immersive reality. Um, my background is uh, working in uh, uh, healthcare, running mental health services, being a commissioner um, in the NHS in the UK. And for a long time, I'd worked uh, providing mental health services. And one day, working in West London, there was a, a really terrible fire um, in, a, a, in an apartment block um, in the west of London called uh, Grenfell. And unfortunately, at that time, uh, many lives were lost in the, in the, in the fire. Um, and leading the local service that responded to that, um, it was very difficult for us to reach out to the people that had been affected. Um, and we did the normal things that you do in the NHS. We went out, handed out squeezy balls and pens, um, handed out flyers, and nobody would talk to us. We didn't really understand how to change that. Um, and one day, after many weeks of trying to engage with the local community, we thought, well, this, this VR thing, why don't we just give it a go? And we took the uh, headsets out into the local community and literally put a, a banner up that said NHS and took some headsets out into the local streets, out into the local markets. Um, and the response was phenomenal. People started to engage with us. People started to talk to us, and people really opened up about a really, really traumatic event. And we thought, there's something, there's something in this. Um, and so my journey has been from that kind of initial engagement with VR to a much wider place. And today we're going to talk to you about what we've done over, over the course of the last two or three years to get there. Sarah. Hi there, everyone. My name is Sarah Tico, and I had a totally different journey into XR. So I was actually uh, an anthropologist by training, and just as I finished university, I worked uh, for a little bit in the NHS before pivoting into contemporary art and film. But it was around that time that I actually had my own experience of uh, mental health, and it was actually through sitting in a doctor's office trying to explain my experience to a psychologist and asking for help that I realized that I didn't have the words to describe my experience and didn't feel particularly understood. And so I ended up uh, exploring immersive technology as a way of telling lived experience. How can we put somebody in the shoes of somebody else? How could I show someone what I was feeling or help somebody else understand what somebody else was feeling? And so I started exploring it creatively and then ended up discovering all the incredible ways that virtual reality was used, not only as a way of shedding light onto lived experience, but also how it can be used to actually improve mental health and well-being. So I ended up becoming a curator at something called the Big Anxiety Festival in Australia, which was an arts and mental health festival developed in collaboration with the university out there. And it was there that I showed all these different experiences that, that explored these, these different perspectives. I, I studied as a researcher as well, so we started developing VR experiences where you could swap bodies, where you could see through the, the eyes of somebody else. I was kind of interested in becoming a PhD student until I realized that I just did not fit in that world. So I ended up moving back to the UK and starting my own company, Hatsumi. But it was through that experience of also speaking to other company founders and saying, what are you doing? How are you selling into the NHS? Like, where does your work exist? That people were like, we don't know. It's so confusing, and we don't know who to speak to. And it just seemed that everybody was working in isolation. 
Uh, and it was around that time that Immerse UK started, which is an organization that's funded through Audiences of the Future and Innovate UK, where they brought together the immersive industry and they were supporting funding applications that would bring together academics and creatives. So I went to them and said, look, we have this really interesting problem. We can actually use VR for pain management, for mental health, well-being, physiotherapy, training and education. But how do we connect all those dots and how do we create that community? And so I worked with them as their healthcare lead and we ran conferences and roundtable events. We did hackathons where we had developers from Grand Theft Auto sitting in the same room as a psychologist and saying, this is so interesting. How can we apply these learnings to create new things together? But it still felt like something was missing. We were still doing a lot of talking about the good work that's happening and bringing it together. And so then this tweet happened uh, in November 2019. And this is actually where the beginning of the immersive healthcare strategy first began. And so it was somebody called Ben Williams from Care City London that made this tweet. And around that time, the BBC had closed down their virtual reality labs. And he said, well, there's so many applications of VR in healthcare. How do we actually get together and think about perhaps how that technology could be gifted to the NHS and it could be used in all these different ways? And so Ross went over and made a presentation and said, hey, look at these opportunities. This is how it could be used. And then there was a discussion, well, how do we gather that evidence? How do we, we prove the, the value of this? And that is where the report started. And so together with a community of, of organizations, researchers uh, from across the UK and globally as well, then we created uh, the report called, titled The Growing Value of XR in Healthcare in the United Kingdom. And with that, we, we brought together the evidence and applications of VR. We had so many case studies. We looked into the health economics of this. What does this actually mean if we invest in this technology? How do we uh, demonstrate the value that it could bring to patients' lives? How it could improve the delivery of technologies? How could it reduce exacerbation of symptoms as well? And we worked with the XR Safety Initiative to create key considerations. What does this mean for cybersecurity? How do we actually apply this in, in real life situations? And finally, we created a series of recommendations as well. And so that's where we, 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 we created the report with a series of recommendations. And we looked at what's happening out in the market at the moment. And there are key areas that are growth areas, both in the UK and the US. So we talked to a lot of colleagues in, uh, in the US, talked to a lot of colleagues in um, uh, Canada and, and Europe, and looked at the areas that were growing the most. And we found that these were um, the management of pain, mental health, physiotherapy, clinical skills, and uh, patient education. So we hung the report around that. Those were the kind of key tenants. Um, in order that we can move the agenda forward. But also, we needed to do something different. We needed a national strategy. We needed to actually get everyone moving in the same direction at the same time. And so what we did, the organizations that you can see here on the screen, we brought those together because they, in the NHS, represent the key um, uh, organizations that would support XR into the future. But the missing piece for us was the glue between that. The, um, uh, the, 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 the ability for somebody that works in, in clinical XR to talk to somebody in academia, somebody that works in business to be able to, to talk to the manufacturers and the developers and to link the patients in. And for us, that was the formation uh, myself and Sarah found, uh, and, and Fiona Kilkelly founded the XR Health Alliance. And the idea behind it is to have a space where XR healthcare can be shared, where people can talk, talk about it, where people can work together to look at the problems and create a solution. Um, and so we brought these, uh, these, these disparate organizations together, um, and with the help of Audience of the Future and UKRI, we actually managed to, to, to do it, to get to this brilliant place where we are the first that have a national strategy for XR. And what we're going to do later is bring the, uh, the, the guys on uh, to, to sit in these lovely white seats and to tell you how they did it. And so I'm just going to go through a little bit around the, the key recommendations that we created in the report. Because I think it's very easy to write a lovely report and say, look at all these great opportunities, but where do we go from here? And so we wanted to create clear action, a, a clear actionable framework that could help move forward that strat strategy. How can we create uh, clarity for businesses, both in the UK and globally, about how you can actually get into the NHS? Uh, and so these are some of our recommendations. 
So firstly, we still really need to know who is out there. Uh, we need to create a baseline of understanding where are all the people hailing from, which sector are they based in. Is it doctors that are in hospitals that have come up with an interesting idea? Is there an artist or a video game developer that has something really interesting that has teamed up with uh, an academic institution? Uh, and understanding these key challenges and opportunities uh, that we need to address as well. So we want to understand how they're funded, uh, what are their business models, and what support do they need as well. And I think there's a real need to do this globally as well and understand that we're not just the UK that are excited about doing this. We started there because that is where we live and that is what we do there. But one of the reasons that we're so excited about being here is to start a conversation with everybody at the conference mm. to think about where we can understand what all those pain points are for everyone. And as part of that, um, yesterday we hosted a round table where there were representatives from the, S uh, the FDA, NIH, um, uh, commercial organizations, academics. And part of uh, our second recommendation was creating um, uh, th this, this, this pipeline that you see. Um, we want to be able to take an idea and to grow that idea robustly, think about how we finance it, think about how we test and scale, um, and, and think about how we sell. Because at the moment, some of the feedback from our session yesterday was, well, where, where do we go? We're like, we're, as, a, as a company in the US, as a company globally, how do we go into healthcare um, and know where the right place to sell? It's, it's, really, it's really complex. And I think the, the report is asking that there's, there's, there's clarity around that and that we can work together with organizations and companies in order that we can create this pipeline so that you can take a good idea and you can scale it robustly. Um, and at the end, one of the, the key, key recommendations for us is when you've gone through that pipeline and created that product, that then there's parity with medication or digital products. So that a, a GP or a clinician would be able to actually prescribe those um, uh, themselves to the patients in the same way as they would prescribe medication. So for us, that's like one of the, um, it's quite chunky and it's quite ambitious, but in order to scale XR in healthcare, to make it actually a reality, this is the, the, the basis of the framework for what we believe we need globally. And so a key underpinning of this as well is that how do we foster that interdisciplinary cross-sector collaboration? How do we bring together academic researchers with healthcare providers, but also with the technology and, and, and creative industries as well? And our vision is really to bring together each vital, part, vital partner to create experiences that are both clinically robust, but also compelling experiences that people want to continue playing as well, and making sure that they have sustainable business models so that we can actually release it into the world as well. And often what we see is there may be two, two organizations work, working together, but that, that kind of three coming together is so important as well. And I've really seen this through my own experience of working on projects as well. Uh, I work on a, with a company called Deep, which is a breath-controlled VR experience. And it started with an artist that just had an idea. I want to make a breath-controlled virtual reality experience where you can travel through this underwater world uh, and used as a way of managing anxiety. And then it was through develop meeting researchers at Games for Emotional and Mental Health Lab that they ended up doing uh, research over it for the last five years. We've just re released the, the randomized control trial about it and thinking about, well, what does it, where does it go next? How do we become a business? And we've been seeing that through our research for such a long time, that how do we bring all those organizations together? How are they funded? And, uh, and how do they move forward as well? And I think our real vision with, with this strategy is to think about how do we connect all those people and how do we connect the entire healthcare ecosystem? How is this work funded? Is it predominantly through VCs and, or grant funding? Uh, how do we work together with startups and businesses to create that pipeline like Ross explained? Uh, how do we work with those hardware and software companies as well? So do we need medical device regulation? Who are those companies that you work with? And again, how do we work with the creative and digital sectors as well? How do we create Oscar award winning content that can improve anxiety? Mm. And I think we need to start having that conversation globally as well and start to um, create those bridges. And so with that, what we're going to do now is actually invite somebody to the stage who was a, a core case study in the report that we did that is doing some absolutely incredible work uh, using virtual reality uh, in healthcare here in the UK as well. So we're going to have a five, uh, few minutes where he's going to talk about that, and then we're going to move to the panel discussion as well. So please welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Farhan Amin. 
Thank you. Farhan, let, take, take a seat. Let's, let's take a seat in, in anticipation for the panel discussion later. Um, we wanted to talk to you and ask you about some of the work that you've been doing in the UK and how that translates across the pond into, into the US. Um, one of the, the, the recommendations that we've shared with the audience was around um, uh, prescribing, being able to digitally prescribe. And we know that that's one of the things that, that you've worked on. Um, also about kind of some of the work you've done in terms of your breakthrough status with the FDA. Please tell us what you've done. So uh, firstly, I'll say thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here. It's absolutely a fantastic and amazing experience. So yeah, I'm a GP, a family physician, as they call it in the US. And uh, I'm also a founder of Concept Health uh, that started a uh, journey some time ago when uh, people weren't talking about VR or AR, 2014. Uh, so I was just recollecting all my thoughts. So it's been a long journey, but uh, we've done things uh, the right way so that uh, the question is how do we actually sell uh, healthcare systems uh, or, or VR uh, solutions to healthcare system is to be able to prescribe something as a clinician, I need to ensure that it's safe, it's effective, it's clean, uh, and it's a complete solution. Mm. Uh, and there are no shortcuts, really, to, uh, for me to, to prescribe any solution. Uh, so that was the first barrier that we need to ensure that what we are producing is clinically safe and effective for the patients. The second one was mindset, that there is a, a cultural mindset within the health system or, or professional that digital is somehow inferior to, to the conventional model of care. And if you add in virtual, it's probably just a novelty factor uh, with very little clinical relevance. So, so the first myth to, to, to overcome was digital is equivalent or in some cases superior to a conventional model of care. And it should be the physician to decide what level, what patient uh, is able to, uh, so physician to decide really what patients need. And it should be available at a click of a button. Uh, just like physician orders lab test, it should be able to order a VR therapy. It should be integrated within the system in a way that is seamless for patients, that is seamless for physicians, and ultimately patients get this treatment just like he goes to the chemist uh, and uh, you know, receive a prescription of the pill, handing over the prescription sort of uh, leave. So that's what we wanted to achieve. That's what I think we managed to achieve as a uh, you know, representative of Concept Health, being the first uh, you know, company in the, in the country, in the UK, to have full end-to-end -end solution that is evidence-based, uh, you know, focusing on Lots of people talking about Web3, but we are talking about healthcare 3.0, 3 where it will be all around smart glasses, immersive technologies, uh, and that would be the focus of it. But to build it around it, we had to, to ensure how do we destigmatize the whole concept and bring it to the mainstream. And uh, then the next challenge was how do you get the regulatory approval, because no clinician would prescribe anything without having regulatory approval. Which is, which is really tough, uh, and they want to ensure that everything goes out safely to patients. You know, ultimately, it's patient's life. Uh, it's not something that if it breaks, you leave it and buy another one. Uh, so we approached, uh, we, we, we are regulated in the US, UK, which is slightly different uh, as a class one medical device, but in the US, the process is different. When we approached FDA, they looked at it, wow. That was the impression we had, so we should go for not the regulatory clearance normal, we should go for a breakthrough device designation. And the idea was, this is one of the first services that is delivered by people could be delivered as a medical device. So a complete shift in perspective that we, we managed to achieve at the regulatory sort of level where we were granted a breakthrough device designation last year uh, by FDA as uh, one of the few companies, in fact, one of the only companies in, in the UK to have achieved that in VR space, AR space. So, uh, so yeah, it's been a fantastic journey, and I think VR is about to, to reach that critical mass, uh, and the shift is likely to happen sometime within the next sort of, uh, 12 to 18 months, where it will become mainstream, and the mobile and the face-to-face -face conventional traditional model will become fringe services. That's what I think will happen, and I'm pretty determined to actually make that happen. Thank you, Farhan. That's absolutely fantastic. And thanks for sharing that with us. I think for, for us, one of the things that came out of the, uh, of, of the report was um, w in order to drive parity, that prescribing model 
um, and the ability for you to scale and actually really, really, truly go out to many patients at the same time was really, really important. So um, thank you very much and thanks for, um, thanks for being here today and sharing that with the audience. Yeah, thanks very much. It's my pleasure. Great. Cool. <laughs> So thanks so much for listening, everyone. If you want to read the report, then you can go to xrhealthuk.org. Uh, you can download it, or it's a fully interactive report as well that has all the case studies and things in there. Uh, if you have any questions, then you can reach out to us at info at xrha.org as well. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter for all the updates. Uh, so it's xrha and then two underscores as well. So now we're going to move to the next stage uh, of, of our, our little gathering uh, and invite uh, Rod, uh, Rod Joyce from NHSX and Neil uh, Ralph from HEE to the stage as well. Thank you. Hello, gents. How are you? Very, very well, good. very, very well, thank you. Good, good. Um, uh, Neil, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how uh, your role of health education in England fits into the NHS? Okay, with pleasure. Thank you, Ross. So, so my name is Neil Ralph, and I'm, um, my role is a Head of Technology Enhanced Learning for a, a, a government body, government organisation called Health Education England. So we're what's known as an arm's length body to our Department for Health and Social Care. The uh, role of Health Education England within the NHS in, 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 in England itself is to be responsible for uh, making sure that we've got the workforce in place to deliver care that we need right now, but also the care of the future. So we have a role to uh, make sure that not just do we have enough workforce, but do they have the right skills? and can we enable them to be in the right place as well within the country so that we can um, make sure that we've got the most important ingredient besides our patients in place to deliver effective quality health care and increasingly also supporting our social care colleagues in their work as well and the team I run Ross is focused upon how can we enable uh, the greatest chance of success within that through the adoption of learning technologies and simulation based approaches to education. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Um, Rod, you work for NHSX. Yeah. Tell us what NHSX is. So, uh, thank you. So, NHSX is a, a body that sits um, across between NHS England, which is our, where our policy is derived, and the, our Department of Health and Social Care. So, we sort of straddle between the two. And the aim of that was to bring those two pieces together, was to, to create the efficiencies in the way that we both look at policy, we look at strategy, but also then tie in some of the other organizations that sit around that. So our regulators, our evidence bodies, and start to bring those things together and give us the opportunity to not do things in silos anymore. Um, you know, we're, we're in a position where we're able to, the, what we're trying to do in NHSX is digitize, connect and transform the NHS. Um, and we have that sort of national view of being able to do that. And our opportunity really is in that transform piece. Um, and that's very much where you know, th this report and the output of this is very much sitting. Um, but, and we would do everything from you know, um, longitudinal care records through to EHR platform rollout and support, but all the way through to looking at innovation, how we support innovation through the system, um, what is needed from a policy perspective, how we drive that forward, how we introduce um, the regulators into that, and make sure we're doing that um, you know, and an approach that's it's sort of like standards by design. Everything's built at the right time for the, um, within that pipeline. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where we are. We're looking at also how we then support those innovators, how we support um, scaling of digital health technology. And, and one of the main aims we have is how do we support our buyers in our system make better decisions around buying digital health tech? Hmm. So whilst we are here to support the suppliers, we're here to support the innovators, we're here to, you know, the people who are transforming the system in the commercial world, it's how do the buyers have the confidence to be able to make those decisions? And what can we do from a national perspective in the center to be able to say, these are good technologies, they're meeting baseline standards. And then also look after sort of the partnerships piece. Um, and that's where this has really, really come into the, uh, its own around this, because what we've done over the last 18 months with COVID is ended up working with hundreds of different partners from across the system. Mm. You know, the, the amount of um, offers that we had from the system, from, from commercial organizations to work with us, 
was significant. And we've been able to prove that we can be agile in the NHS, and we can transform the way that we think about things. So yeah, a really broad spectrum of things. So it, it, it's interesting, because a lot of the conversations we've heard um, here already around uh, uh, the, the metaverse and what is it and how does it work, um, uh, one of the, the, the key considerations is around standards and around privacy, and that can be pretty chaotic, potentially. How, how in, in health do, do, do you think we'll work in that area? So, yeah, it's, whilst it's, it's not the, the sexiest of subjects, <laughs> it's, um, it's something that is really close to my heart in that we need to make sure that technology that's being used in the system is treated the same way as drugs that is meeting baseline standards. And we're working with both partners within the system and within the ecosystem to say, how do we do that better? Uh, we're conscious that we're not meeting the right standards at the moment. So over the last 18 months, we've also deployed a, a new standard, the Digital Health uh, Technology Assessment Criteria um, within the NHS. And that is a baseline standard for all digital health tech. So whether it's VR, whether it's an EHR, you know, the whole spectrum in between, everybody needs to meet that new baseline standard which is great, it's, it's, it's very much the baseline. It isn't where we want to get to, but to get everybody on that similar baseline and then be able to move that together mm. collectively. Now, we also know that different technologies need different things. So we, we're conscious that we can't load all the requirements into those baselines. We can actually build specific things. So we can have DTAC for VR and XR. So there'll be specific things as and when interoperability improves and we get things right in telemedicine we'll build that into the baseline standards. So mm. it gives us the opportunity to build from within. And more importantly, as, su as suppliers are building their products now, they know what standards to build them to. Because mm. retrospectively fitting standards into a system, trust me, is really, really hard. Mm. Um, and if we, can, if we can support suppliers and, and innovators now to build those products by design, meeting standards, being open source, you know, publishing those libraries at the right time, they have an opportunity to get through that pathway quicker, you know, the pathway that you put up. And clinical safety and evidence and efficacy shouldn't be something that we think about at the end. Mm. It has to be built in from the beginning. And I know, Farron, you've, you've obviously been through that experience. Mm. Thanks, Rod. Um, so moving, so that's, that's broadly how the NHS, uh, how NHS X fits into the NHS. Looking at um, uh, Immersive and the work that we've done here, what, what do you think is the special source? Like, how have we got to this position where we've got a national strategy for XR um, and, and health? And, and where, where, do you think it, where do you see it going next? Yeah, I, th I think the, the tweet that you put up was, is really much where it started. But it, it gave everybody the opportunity to get behind something. And I think it galvanized so many people to go, oh, yeah, well, I'm doing that. Well, I'm, I'm doing a bit of that. And we've seen that model work elsewhere. And I think being able to have the report and the movement of people behind that report really gave us the opportunity to say, we've got probably one chance to get this right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll go into an area where other, other technologies aren't working together. Um, they're working in competition. Of course, they are. But they're not working together for the greater good whether that's, say, standards or interoperability of data and sharing data, I think we have an opportunity to be ahead of the game with XR. I think that's really important that we don't miss that opportunity because there's a chance to become so fragmented very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I think being able to do that, the amount of people that we've spoken to, you know, everybody on this and others who are keen to lean in um, and offer their support, advice, guidance, um, and, you know, capabilities. And I think if we can get that right now, the opportunity for us to move forward is really significant. But the, the report has really helped galvanize that. To have that national strategy is a real marked difference. And it, I hadn't thought about this until after the round table yesterday we were talking post. I think it's really helped me understand how I build the capabilities we're trying to do to scale digital health technology. We recently launched something called our Partnership Award, where we wanted to make sure that NHS organizations didn't just have the technology available, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to create capacity. Mm. What's hard to do is to ensure that we get patient activation right, we maximize that capacity, that we get um, the right technology partners, the, whether they're, they're big players, small players, but also the right impact and evaluation partners. And bringing those people together right at the beginning has allowed them all to lean in and think very, very differently about what value they add to projects. And we're, we're very much in the first stage. We've just opened up the second phase of that. But the conversations we've had so far 
uh, remind me very much of where this is um, because I think if we, if this, as and when this works, I'm pretty confident it will, uh, we'll be able to move forward and use that model for other things. As I said, I've, I've borrowed it already for um, our interoperability of remote monitoring uh, paper that we're in the middle of finalizing to say we need, there's so much speciality and expertise out of the system, we need to make sure that we look outwardly and make sure we bring that in we create the capability, and the capability can stay in the system, the partners, and then can go back out and commercialize their products. Brilliant. Thank you, Rod. Um, Neil, uh, it, it's interesting. The, for, for me, I think the model in HEE um, uh, to kind of share XR into health is, is brilliant. Can you, can you tell us a bit about, about that and, and what you do and how you kind of um, are scaling um, immersive in health? With, with pleasure, pleasure uh, Ross. So um, just to start with, with, the, with the challenge a little bit, and I'll tell you about the uh, sort of uh, approach that we're, uh, we've, we're built and we're now rolling out. Um, much like uh, within the States or in other developed countries, in fact, in middle-income countries as well and more wider, we've got a massive capability and capacity crunch in terms of having enough people in specialist healthcare world roles or more general healthcare roles to deliver the care that's required to meet the demand that's coming downstream. Uh, within um, uh, populations within a country, and that, that very much is the case for us within England, within within the UK. Um, how do we how do we knit more nurses and doctors basically with the skills they need, or AHPs, etc. And, and 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 how do we also keep the existing 1.4 million uh, of our NHS workforce and the many hundreds of thousands of clinicians within that? up to date with the skills that are also required because as we, we you know, we'll all be familiar with both in our general experience of what's in the press or going to, to, to receive care in a hospital. The, uh, what we do to deliver healthcare is, 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 um, is changing at pace. Mm. Um, so we, we have both the need to make sure that we are continually training the numbers we need, but at the skills we need, and then keeping those people with those skills uh, as on top of what they need in the latest moment as possible. Um, and that's a massive challenge, and the pandemic has come along, and it has magnified that challenge a number of times over, really. So within the organisation, we've been looking out for... for, for um, uh, approaches and solutions that enable us to try and um, try and try and shrink that issue really and uh, we're doing that in a numer numerous different ways but one of the um, sort of uh, you know, categories of, of solutions that, that we think are really important is that application of XR technologies so the ability to bring uh, virtual reality augmented and mixed reality into um, educational um, interventions, whether that's within universities or we're in our care settings, hospitals or in primary care. And so I was tasked with the uh, challenge of looking at how we might do that, but not how do we run a number of pilots over a couple of years, but actually within a single year, how do you accelerate adoption at scale hmm. across the country? How do you, op how do you um, expose these sorts of technologies to the uh, tens of thousands of, um, of clinical educators that we got there or to the many hundreds of hospitals or in, actually you know, many thousand primary care sites that we've got. How do we do that at pace? And by the way, we've got no patients, Neil. Probably don't have huge amounts of money to throw <laughs> at you to make this happen, but we expect some results. Mm. So... Um, we, we, so no we, pressure. So no pressure there at all. So, uh, and, um, so we, we, we thought quite um, hard about this, about how we might try and square that circle. And uh, we came up with the concept of XR hubs, mm -hmm. the concept of our virtual XR hubs. And uh, ostensibly what these are is our ability to uh, create a virtual library of, um, of hardware and software applications mm. uh, as a central resource um, that can be drawn down on a regional basis by people involved in healthcare education, um, both at a local level within a hospital or the wider infrastructure that, for instance, manages the placement of our, our doctors in training through the system against their different specialities. So we've, we've, what we've done there is we've, we've built this library, but we realised that at the same time, we can't just have a load of resources sitting there 
that, 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 you know, that we know is efficacious in, 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 in its uh, sort of educational pedagogical effectiveness. We've also got to put the groundwork in to expose our colleagues in education to this opportunity. So what are we doing about winning over those, those, those sort of hearts and minds? Um, which is, you know, what we're opening up there is a big change program. Mm. Um, and getting them on board and getting the leadership on board to feel confident that actually if they back this within their, you know, within their region, within their locality, that, you know, it's not going to fall down on them. It's not going to make them look bad or cause them more problems and issues to resolve. That actually, you know, it, it, it's going to work. It's going to deliver some effects. It's going to ultimately improve the lot for our learners and for our educators and try and remove some of that pain rather than increase it. And at the same time, we realise that what we can't do is expect that the NHF infrastructure can just um, you know, readily adopt these technologies. We've also got to support them. We've got to hold their hand to understand what sort of infrastructure challenges they need to overcome. Um, because they've got an awful lot on their plate. There's an awful lot of expectations of rapid adoption of electronic patient records and all sorts of things that, that eclipse really what we're asking them to do. So we... We, we've worked with um, other teams in terms of um, creating some solutions that just give them a, a guiding hand, really. Um, and then at the same time, we also can't put these devices into the hands of educators who are very much used to delivering excellent education, but through a certain format, with a certain approach. So um, we... we we can't just help our IT colleagues make sure that the you know uh, Hololens can connect to their Microsoft uh, tenant and 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 works through the broadband, but also Is that Rod's responsibility. That, that's yeah, Rod's that's responsibility. Job, yeah. But we're giving him a hand with this, just <laughs> in terms of the the pace that we've got to push this adoption out. But we've also got to help the educators because they're not confident, the learners are not confident. The, the educational outcomes are not achieved. So we've got what we see is this fairly comprehensive sort of end-to-end -end, uh, proposition that we're rolling out through our colleagues, out to the system. And what we're achieving there is we're massively re re you know, re reducing that friction for adoption. We've got a certain critical mass of capability that we're deploying out to the system. Mm. We're putting it in the hands where they're starting to get some real educational benefit from it. But at the same time, we are e exposing them to the potential of this technology. Mm. We're growing their understanding, their confidence and their capability to start to integrate it into what they do. And what we're creating is the conditions where they say, we want to go further. Mm. We want to do more. We can see the return on investment. And this enables us to start to create the, that environment where, where it's not just the funding from my budget that is driving this revolution, we're, we're starting to be able to tap into all the different funding streams that enable us to start to, I think, accelerate adoption at a scale with a technology that is, mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think is comparable, to be honest, what I think we're going to be able to achieve. I'm extremely excited. i can say one more thing, so I know I'm talking an awful lot here, Ross. <laughs> what, what we also want to see is that within this sort of context we're creating, it's, we, you know, we, we absolutely want to benefit from big tech, and the innovations that come from that. But what's critically important is being able to tap into the innovation, uh, the small, medium enterprise, our entrepreneurs, our innovators, our creatives, and creating the kind of environment where they can start to share in mm. so have some, you know, the fabulous innovations that, that come from, out from, from those sources. And you know, with, with Rod, Rod and his team are really leading the way in taking that wider context in the country within that, but there are other institutions within academia or sit between, bridge between the NHS commercial industry and academia, mm. we, will, we, we are bringing with us on that journey because we really need them to help us get this right yeah. because yeah. the opportunity is massive. But at the same time, we're going to be very um, strict in what we allow to happen because the patient and the benefit to the patient is central here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing that galvanizes everything is that we're doing this for the patient. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's not just an immersive experience. It has to be something that benefits the patients, as Neil said, it's efficacious. It has evidence associated with it. And we can use our evidence um, organizations and, as, um, to make sure that we're delivering good, better, potentially better outcomes for patients that use digital. 
and it isn't a substitute. It's actually a better solution for them. Yeah. But that's the thing that galvanizes everything um, that we do, is that we have the patient's needs at the heart of it. So yeah. um, it's, it's really fascinating. And the other thing that came out to the round table, I was going to say, was you know, the, the challenges we have within our IT department are exactly the same challenges that colleagues from America were saying that they have exactly the same challenges there. So there's so many things I think that we can collaborate on and, and resolve collectively. You know, international views of these things are going to really, really help change the way that we think about these things in the very long term. Yeah, thanks. Thanks both. I think that that's the really important message um, uh, in a lot of the work that we've done, isn't it? It's, it's we are creating a set of circumstances. <clears throat> we're creating a framework whereby we're listening to the academics, we're listening to the patients, we're listening to everybody involved in kind of from a commercial perspective that there is a framework there. It's really clear where businesses can come to the UK and work with us um, and invest and safely and, and, and to start to scale up. So I think that's, that's a really important message. Thank you. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to ask Sarah um, was in terms of gaming and in terms of arts, what can we learn from those spheres and how can we kind of Get, bring them together because it's great. We've created this lovely big framework, but how you know what? what where, what's the magic of VR and how, how do we how sort of XR and how how do we put those two things or three things together? How, do, how does that work in in tandem? I think the arts and health have, have always been hand in hand. Really, I mean, when you think back to even like the first sort of art that we found, like fertility sculptures, were all around health, right? Uh, but I think arts is, is a great way to talk about health. Uh, looking at even recent um, uh, experiences that have come out, Goliath, that was created by a UK organization called Anagram, where they created a VR experience talking about the lived experience of psychosis. And so many people have come forward and said, that's me, or I've had that experience, or I've, I've known somebody that has gone through that. And actually using this as a way of having really vital conversations with the public. Uh, the same with Ninja Theory that made a game called Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. They collaborated with a neuroscientist from the Ox uh, University of Cambridge uh, called Paul, Paul Fletcher, and very cool guy. And, uh, and they created this experience that was really about understanding the lived experience of psychosis. And they just made it as an entertainment experience. But again, so many people came forward and said, gosh, I actually really understand what my friend has been through, uh, through this. And now we're actually having conversations about that. So I think there's the, the role of the arts in talking about healthcare, but also mm. even things like singing is so important for like mental health and well-being, uh, being creative, journaling even. And I think VR enables you to, to take that one step forward. Like the one thing that I feel like everyone always shows people uh, when they go into VR for the first time is like Beat Saber dancing, uh, but also Tilt Brush. Like how incredible is it to like float through space and paint with fire? And there are already art therapists that are really enthusiastic about how this can actually change what art therapy is. And, and that's the sort of work that I'm doing with Hatsumi as well, is like how we do, uh, we create an experience where you can actually visualize the embodied experience of pain and emotion by illustrating that onto an avatar, when sometimes we don't have the, the words to describe that experience, but the arts can enable us to do that. So we're using that as a catalyst for patients to have a, a completely different conversation with their clinician. So you can create that illustration when you're in the waiting room, take this artwork in and say, it, it feels like this. And it's so interesting because when you create this new medium for people to talk about their experience, they're not just talking about that pain in their leg, they're, they're talking about their emotional experience as well. And I think that's one of the, the great characteristics of VR and AR, that it's embodied and health is an embodied experience as well. But I think ultimately, I think it's about making people want to engage in their own health and not just at the point when somebody needs help, when they need to have their, their rehabilitation. And that's great because you're gamifying it, right? You're making it fun. You're making people want to do all those exercises because the drop off for physiotherapy is just absolutely huge. Um, but I think there's also a real opportunity in preventative care. I think we want to make looking after your health just a fun mainstream thing that we do, not just a chore. Uh, and so even things like uh, geolocative experiences, encouraging people to get outside and just have a walk and appreciate the world that we live in, I think has, has such a, a vital role. Um, and it means that things can exist in, in so many different places. With, with Deep, the, the breath-controlled VR experience I work on, I, we took that to Cannes Film Festival, 
uh, a few months ago. And it was amazing to be able to say, we are at this uh, you know, incredible film festival, but also we've got a randomized control trial behind this as well. Hmm. And being able to actually bring these ideas to new audiences that might not even be thinking uh, about deep breathing to manage anxiety, um, and ultimately being able to understand these experiences, try them, but actually like the long-term benefits as well. Because what we don't want to do is get people hooked on VR and being like, I have to do this every day. But actually, the skills that you learn uh, through that, and what we found with Deep as well, is that uh, people can try it, the experience for 10 minutes. They feel significantly calmer after they've traveled through this beautiful underwater world through slow, deep breathing. But also, the long-term changes in people's ability to self-regulate their emotions and just imagine what it was like in that, that beautiful world. And when you're panicking about to give a talk in front of a bunch of people and being like, huh. Remember to breathe. And I think that's the, the important, that's the, the really exciting thing about VR, and that we do need to work with, with entertainment as well. Mm. So I think there's so many opportunities going forward, and it is just really about that, that cross-sector application. And I guess one last thing to add as well is that a few years ago, I did some consultancy with uh, an organization called NESTA, the National Endowment of Science, Technology, and the Arts. And, and we looked into all this stuff, and you know, what is the role of the arts uh, and creative practice in VR for mental health. And we found that there were so many artists out there that were already creating incredible things that could be used in, in health and well-being. Uh, almost accidentally, there were so many people that, that wanted to do something cool. I think a great example is um, Lucas Risotto's Where Thoughts Go. He wanted to make this fun, playful experience, but as he said in his talk yesterday, he was like, I accidentally created group therapy. But when I spoke to him about, well, what are you going to do with this? Like, you've, you've launched it on uh, you know, all these different platforms, but do you want, want to work with psychologists and, and think about how it could be in healthcare? And it's like, well, I don't know how. How do we find those partners, and how do we work with them? And so it's some of these findings that led to uh, something called the Immersive Mental Health Fellowships, uh, an organization called Story Features Academy, uh, and some of our, our delegation out, out here representing whoop, whoop. them. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> and, uh, and so they created a new funding opportunity where artists and startups that had interesting ideas that can be applied in, in, in mental health could actually be uh, paired with uh, psychologists and researchers from the university. They could co-create these experiences. They could create an, an evidence base behind it. Uh, and then release it to the world. So I'm really excited for more opportunities like that to happen as well. Thank you, Sarah. That's the thing, isn't it? It's so exciting. The opportunity to bring immersive into healthcare. Healthcare can often be quite, quite difficult and, and, um, and quite formulaic. And to bring that kind of artistic and creative edge into it and the gamified experience just really, for me, is, is something that motivates me every day. Um, OK. Question and answer time. Now, don't all rush at once. Um, but if you've got any questions for this gorgeous looking panel, <laughs> please join us and, and ask us a question. We will, uh, we will answer mostly honestly um, and in our capacity um, as experts in the field from the UK. But also in terms of like, you know, for you um, as an audience in the US, what, what, what would what would help um, uh, make those links between the UK and, and US? So please, um, if you've got a question, be so bold as to stand up and ask us, and we will answer. Or otherwise, I'll just ask silly questions. No? Oh, yeah, please, sir. Come and, come and take the mic. Thank you. Oh, great. Ah. There's a come mic the there. Yeah, come come the mic. just a bit forward. We should be able to hear you. Thank you. Hi, yes, yeah, so I'm Alex from Simply Video from the UK. My, my first question was going to be, how did you guys all find each other with the NHS and your respective organisations being so big? And my second question was, <laughs> then be, of, of the devices that you use, what, what XR devices have you got across the spectrum? Um, Lovely. Thanks. OK. Um, so how do we find each other? Who's going to answer that? I think we're still finding each other, aren't we? <laughs> I, think, I think you know the, the, the team we've got well. together now. I think is is great, and there's you know there's a huge amount of work. But you know just being here, you know Neil and I've been able to talk about how the team back in NHSX who are doing a lot of the the centres of expertise and running the vision and the strategy need to come a lot closer to the work that Neil's doing in health education, edu health education England. Um, but we are still finding people who are doing incredible work in the UK and bringing them into that alliance and everybody we meet now we have something to get behind 
And it's not just, you know, right, we found the five people. As I said, there's more people in the audience doing incredible work around this, from funding to storytelling to everything. So the, as we find people now, we're able to get behind and say, be part of it together, be part of the national strategy, and actually it seems to be coming together. Yeah. Absolutely. And just to add to that as well, I think there's been some really great stuff happening to build that community as well. Even just online communities are so valuable. Um, really recommend checking out just a Facebook group called VR Doctors that was set up by uh, Dr. Keith Grimes uh, in the UK. And it's just a group where people could post what they were doing, ask for help and support. It was such a useful uh, resource for all of us over the years. So I think that's how I first heard about you, Ross. Yeah, yeah. And then it wasn't until uh, one of our colleagues, Rosie Collins, that worked with Ross uh, on Grenfell said, you two have to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a conference that happened uh, where we actually met in person. We were like, oh, this is really interesting. But I think, yeah, just over the years of, of being able to just gather together, people to share the work that they're doing. But Sarah, it exposes a problem. So it's, it's, it's been organic. It's been too iterative and organic. And, it, mm. it, and that's, that's difficult because there are people we're not talking to still that we should be talking to. So one of my motivations for being part of this and, and, and for, for, for also through my team, you know, encouraging others to get part of this is that we need to, we need to make it easier. We need to find people. We need to create a, um, you know, a, a, a known kind of group, branded group, collection of people that we can advertise through the communities across the NHS to say, if you're interested in this, if you think it's going to be a benefit to you, this is who you come and talk to. Yeah, yeah. You know, we really need to, yeah, yeah. We really need to meet to make it really easy I, for I think then if, when we go to, you know, regulators, when we go to evidence standards bodies, we go collectively. It isn't just one organisation knocking the door saying, well, I've got, a, I've got something new. How, how would you look at this? How would you regulate it? It's collectively the industry is going saying, right, we are ready for this to be looked at. We're ready for us to build you know, evidence standards to be able to look at how, how we deliver impact evidence and how we deliver patient efficacy evidence. But we can do that together. And I think that's, you know, I certainly know the, the MHRA, our regulator in the UK, are, are much happier with that approach as opposed to individual organizations or individual technologies knocking on the door um, yeah. piecemeal. And, and um, I'm, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to move on to the, the question about um, the tech, Farhan. Um, tell us about your experience, you know, what, um, it, it, is it everything, is it specific uh, headsets and software, or wh where, where do you see it um, in the UK and, what, on, um, and where should we go in terms of different applications of hardware? Uh, thanks Ross, I mean, uh, in terms of technology, XR is, is uh, only just started, uh, I mean, the technology is growing exponentially, so the opportunities are exponential. And uh, as some of the presenters have uh, talked from Nine Tech and Qualcomm and others, that this is just only the beginning of Web, web 3 or, or, or healthcare 3 as well. Neil alluded to the point that we have got shortage of workforce and we, we will re continue to have that problem. So we need to find different ways of delivering that care. Mm. Uh, and as Rod was saying about uh, uh, you can't just uh, have a wild west of uh, letting loose lots of technology because it's patient care ultimately. So we, we know there's a shortage of people. We know there's, uh, uh, we need to deliver safe care. But as an innovator for myself, uh, but also a clinician, I understand that there's a safe, uh, we need to prescribe something which is safe and effective uh, for patients. Uh, so, I mean, having those three different uh, uh, elements uh, uh, of uh, you know, understanding uh, has been really critical in terms of helping us leapfrog lots of stuff that is still rudimentary in various other countries to be able to have an end-to-end -end solution where we can deploy uh, XR or augmented reality based glasses. In fact, we're just going to launch a whole system-wide deployment of using AR to deliver community services, which is again being supported as a part of the national strategy to drive innovation uh, in a safe and effective way and continuously evaluate to, to help support the colleagues learn better, deliver better care, but also address some of the challenges. So there's no one device, one solution one, uh, would actually help. And we need to, to be mindful, like Charlie said, that it will be lots of little M's, not one big M, yeah. that will ultimately transform the healthcare system. Uh, and we need to promote, support, harness all those little M's. Well, I might want to be a little big M, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's what we, I think we should support and promote. 
Thank you, Farhan. Um, well, that's our time, ladies and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. we. I, I think we'll get told off um, because there's a clock ticking. I'm very, very sorry. That's our um, time that we've got available today. Thank you for those that stayed and listened to us. Um, and thank you to the panel. You've been fantastic. Um, we've come so far. Mm -hmm. We've got further to go. Yeah. But um, thank you for joining us for the journey. Now, thanks very much for your <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys, so much. Thank you, guys. All right, and that's, that's lunch, everybody. So a perfect lead into lunch. So we'll be back here, a bit of a break. We'll be back here at 2.15 for our next talk. We'll have some, someone from Meta, the other Meta, um, a different Meta, um, talking about uh, AR prescription lenses. So come back for that, enjoy lunch, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody, from the NHS and, and, and the UK. Thanks for doing it.